Welcome back, everyone, to another week of the Chaos Ball Podcast. Thanks for tapping in again this week. After a, I'd call it a successful week of Mariners baseball from last Friday to this Friday. Uh, But before I talk about the Mariners, and I don't have as much to say this week about the Mariners as I did last week. Uh, Last week I was coming off a week break from, from having a show, and this week... You know, there's I could really delve into game specific stuff, but if you watch the games, you know what happened. Uh, so I have some manner stuff to talk about, but overall, just it's going to be a light episode. But to start, I do want to talk about Willie Mays for a second. Willie Mays uh, just passed away at the age of 93, I believe, uh, the other day. Very sad moment in in baseball. Willie Mays is one of the, if not the biggest giant of the game. Pun. And pun not intended, pun intended and unintended there because he was a giant for, I mean, you can't say his entire career, but essentially you can cut out those last two years on the Mets and he was, for the most part, a giant. Uh, his entire career, a a man that everyone I've ever heard speak about him has spoken super highly of. Uh, he is deeply in, embedded in baseball's history. Base, like he, for a lot of people, he is baseball, uh, and for a lot of different reasons, he he is baseball. And people think of baseball, they think of Willie Mays. Uh, he was Barry, he's Barry Bonds' godfather, I believe. Like this guy is is baseball through and through. Um, it was really sad and also poetic that they're doing the games at Rickwood Field, the oldest uh, baseball field in America, uh, and where he got his start with the Birmingham Black Barons. He got his first professional hit there as a 17 year old kid in Birmingham, it's crazy that he died during, uh, I think it was the minor league, like the double a game that was going on there. And today when I'm recording on Thursday, they're playing the major league game there. And it's just crazy that, um, this is, uh, he, he passed away during this monumental, uh, monumental event. And there was already going to be a lot of Willie Mays content for these few days, uh, Obviously, because you got to start there, so many others did. But there's, you know, there was no one more famous who played at Rickwood Field than Willie Mays, and he released like a statement uh, last week, or I think, uh, about he he wasn't gonna make it uh, to go actually watch. We hope you're watching on TV. Uh, and that statement was reading it after he passed. Super sad, but Willie Mays, if you have looked at watched anything about the history of baseball, looked on baseball reference at the history of baseball, you have probably seen Willie Mays' name. I think I was texting my brothers this, and uh, I think a lot of people I saw have this same kind of kind of take on the internet. He is one of baseball's goats, and he might have the most... He might have the biggest argument for the goat of baseball there's almost no no there's not almost there's no holes that you can really point to in his career that discount his goat status and baseball i don't think baseball needs a goat i don't think a sport like i don't think sports in general need a goat to be honest uh the basketball conversation is tiresome hockey i think it's easy there's one guy above everyone else that one's just a gimme football i feel like there's i don't know maybe maybe there's one goat Baseball, it's baseball. The modern era of baseball is 130 years old, basically. The history of baseball is over 150. Uh, and I don't think you need a goat, but I think you have you have those guys who are like, those are the ones. And I was saying to my brothers, like, we probably have, what, in the modern history of baseball from 1901 on, there's probably five, ten guys you could consider the greatest of all time in that span. And... My oldest brother, shout out to you, Tyler, if you're listening, listed uh, some that I think are very accurate. I think it's Willie. He said Willie, Barry, uh, Ruth Splinter, who's Ted Williams, uh, Aaron Wagner, that's Honus, and uh, Ty Cobb. And then he mentioned Willie, Aaron, this is Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, and Barry Bonds. They're the only ones with their careers integrated the whole time, which is a very good point. Um I think a lot of people could argue because Willie Mays played his entire career and integrated ball except for 13, 13 games on the Birmingham Black Barons that 
he had the biggest case for being the GOAT simply because he played an in integrated baseball. Whereas, yeah, all those guys before, like Ruth, you could argue his competition uh, back in the day too. And then Ted Williams was probably the closest to Willie Mays, I'd say. But even he played before uh, integrated ball. So, and that was kind of the start of baseball's heyday, I guess, that he played in the 40s, 50s, and overlap with Willie Mays. But um, most of the 40s, was not integrated baseball, and I, I don't, I just don't know. And like Ty Cobb, obviously, again, same with Ruth. Like competition back in the day, also not integrated. Also, we hate Ty Cobb. Uh, Honus Wagner, same thing, same thing. Like I think, I think you have Ruth Wagner and Cobb in terms of like position player wise, and and we'll throw Ted Williams in there too. Of guys who before integration, probably the goats of of white ball, I would say. Uh, and then, you know, there's some pitchers that you could throw in there. But, uh, yeah, Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, Barry Bonds, I like those three for my brother. I think I think Ken Griffey Jr. could be thrown in there, but simply because of aura. His stats and longevity don't match up really to Willie Mays, Hank Aaron, and Barry Bonds. Like, I mean, Ken Griffey Jr. is a no-doubt Hall of Famer. But I think uh, if anyone has an argument for cultural impact – Greatest of all time in the modern, modern era. Like, I feel like Griffey is probably up there, maybe on a, a second tier behind those guys. But I think Willie has has the case. It's pretty ironclad to be the GOAT. I mean, he played, again, fully integrated. He started his career as a 17-year-old uh, in the Birmingham Black Barons and then went to Major League Ball uh, in the minor leagues. And then 1951, he made his debut for the New York Giants, and he won Rookie of the Year. He then went on to just have one of the, if not the greatest careers in the history of the sport. Uh, and he kind of has everything here. So he's somewhat a bridge to old baseball and new baseball. He, again, made his debut in 1951. That was very shortly after baseball was integrated, uh, thanks to Jack Robinson and Larry, Larry Doby. And he played on the New York Giants, and he stayed on that team as they went to San Francisco to become the San Francisco Giants. And in 1958, obviously, the Brooklyn Dodgers also went to uh, Los Angeles. That marked a huge moment in baseball history, expanding to the West Coast. He played before they had the 162-game schedule uh, up until, let's see, he played 1951 to... 19, yeah, 61. And then in 62, I think is when the National League finally added the 162 game schedule the year before the American League expanded to 162. But then the National League in 1962 expanded. So he played before the schedule we currently know and after the schedule we currently know. He played 162 after that. And he also had his career paused at the very start to go to war. And that is deeply embedded in baseball history. That is a part of some of the greatest of all time. Ted Williams is probably the most famous soldier. I, I, like Joe DiMaggio, I, I know, went to war. Like uh, the greatest players of all time from back in that day all went to war, basically. And so he has that notch on his resume, too. He's got gold gloves aplenty. He has MVP awards. He has Rookie of the Year. He has over 600 home runs. He has, what, how many hits does he have? He has over 3,000 hits. He's a 301 career batting average guy. He has every single stat also to back up his his GOAT status. Um, and it's just hilarious. So 1951, he made his debut. One rookie of the year. 1952, 34 games played. Uh, and then Korea, the Korean War happened. And that halted the season. And then 1953, he did not play. He was in Korea. The year he got back from the Korean War, he played 151 games, and I think they played 154. So all but three games he played. He hit 345, 411, 667 for a 1,078 OPS, won the MVP award. His first year back from Korea when he was 23 years old. Like, this guy was just built different. And it's funny looking now, he also played before gold gloves. I mentioned he was the bridge. He was the bridge between old baseball and new baseball, and it ushered in this heyday of baseball in the 60s and the 70s where baseball was just thriving, thriving. And Willie Mays was arguably the face of that sport that was thriving. And 
he's widely regarded as one of the greatest fielders, if not the greatest fielder in the history of the game at maybe the hardest position in the game in center field. When he was on the New York Giants, they played at the Polo Grounds. I don't know if you're familiar with the the dimensions of the Polo Grounds, but that is probably the hardest center field to play in the history of the sport, I would guess. And he played before gold gloves. So they first introduced gold gloves in 1957. He had played five years before that. So he has 12 gold gloves, likely would have 16 or 17 if they had done it when he started his career. And then I mentioned his two MVPs. There's one in 1954 and one in 1965. And he arguably had better seasons in between those. I mean, those are insane. And if you grade his numbers and stuff now, in our frame of mind in modern baseball, he probably has five MVPs, maybe more. They just didn't really value the same the same thing back in back in the day. So, you know, he didn't lead the league in RBIs ever. And that, you know, that was kind of a big thing back then. Uh, he led the league in hits once. Also, also a big thing back then. He only led the league in batting average one time. He led the league in steals a few times too. Uh, so you look back and you look at who won the MVPs over him and you kind of, kind of look at it in the context of it was baseball in the fifties and sixties. If he put up these stats now, he would, yeah, he'd have more than two MVP awards, but he was just an insane player. I mean, 24 all-star games. And I think he played 23 years in the sport. They sometimes had multiple all-star games back in the day. Old baseball was crazy. Uh, yeah, stolen base guy, home run guy. I mean, he has how many home runs? 660. And 660, he only played 34 games in 52, didn't play a season in 53. There's a good case that he could have, he averaged like basically 35, 40 home runs a year in his playing career. So feasibly, he could have over 700 home runs if he didn't go to the Korean War. He was just an otherworldly player, a again, a giant of the sport. He will be missed. Stats don't even do him justice, but but go look at his stats if you haven't. He has 156.2 career baseball reference war, and people who have made that statistic have often said it's super hard to quantify defensive war, especially from back in baseball in this era. So 156 baseball reference war... In his 23-year career, which, man, guys just don't play that long anymore, um, that might be a conservative estimate for truly how statistically valuable this guy was. Uh, Just a sensational player. I mean, one of the guys on the list of, if you could go back and watch any athlete ever, Willie Mays was genuinely my number one, maybe two, three. He's a top three for me my entire life. It's like him, him and Satchel Paige are maybe one, two for me. And... I'm I'm glad he lived such a long life. I uh, he passed away peacefully, apparently. Um and, and maybe he's the greatest of all time in baseball. But I want to talk a little bit about Willie Mays and uh the the stuff they're doing at Rickwood Field for him today is really cool. And uh yeah, I'm sure there would be more stuff, but the the goat of a hundred and fifty plus year sport potentially is insane to think about. So R. I. P. to Willie Mays. And and now we'll get into a different topic completely. The 2024 Seattle Mariners. What have the Seattle Mariners been up to? Eh, They just dropped two to Cleveland. Uh, Tough. Cleveland's always tough to play, and they're a really good team this year. Uh, They got trounced yesterday, 8-0. The first game of of the series was, should have been a easier win than it was, but they ended up taking that, taking that win. The offense had a good day. Uh, absolutely horrible 8-0 loss, like I mentioned, on Wednesday. And then today, as I'm recording, they lost 6-3 at a game that started at 10 a.m. this morning. Trying to watch simultaneously the Euros and Seattle Mariners baseball and also attempt to get some work done. It was it was it was a challenge, and really the work kind of fell by the wayside this morning as I watched soccer and baseball uh, until noon, basically. Um, but I I will I will take one win in Cleveland. They're a really good team, especially because now 
they go to the Marlins on the road after after being in Cleveland, and I I think it's I don't think any series is an automatic win, but the Marlins are just not playing good baseball. They haven't been the entire year. Uh, but the reason why I'm okay with two losses to Cleveland, they swept the Rangers over the weekend. I left uh, the Thursday recording after they had failed to mop the White Sox, but in high spirits as they headed into a huge series with the Rangers at home. And they, I wouldn't say they crushed them, but they swept them. Close game Friday. Uh, on Saturday, they tried to blow it. Bizardo tried to try to really blow that thing up. Uh, he didn't, and then they cruised to an easy one on Father's Day on Big Dumper Stadium seat cushion night, which is phenomenal. They sweep the Rangers in a series where the Rangers could have gained some really key ground in the division. They did not. The Mariners said, no, we're going to handle business, and they swept them. So I'll take the series loss to Cleveland, whatever. I, I would have liked to win today's game. Uh, Wednesday's game was that was forsaken from the start. And they are still leading the division by a good amount. Uh, sweeping the Rangers was huge. I like really, it went swimmingly. Like the weekend was phenomenal. Uh, and after they beat Cleveland in Game One of the series, they uh, were ten games up on both the Astros and the Rangers, which was surreal to look at. And as I am sitting here on June twentieth, the Mariners are eight games above the Astros, who are now in second place, and eight and a half above the Rangers in third. Still a huge cushion. A huge cushion for the 44 and 33 Mariners with a plus 11 run differential. I've been wanting to see it. The run differential equals the amount of games above 500. I would like to know if there's any team that's done that and finished the season like that because that is ridiculous. It's just, uh, why are they like this? I just don't get it. Uh, but it, again, largely good week of Mariners baseball. I have a couple of things to get to, um, but this this might be a short and sweet episode. Again, like I said, they're eight games up of the Astros in second place. They go to the Marlins and the Rays this week. Uh, and then just cruising over to the Fangraphs playoff odds. The Mariners are currently at 86.2% to make the playoffs and a 79.1% to win the division. I Their projected win loss is 88.5, which is still, that feels fair. I, again, in my life, I think I mentioned this last week, in my in my entire life, I have never once seen the Mariners be this far ahead in the division this late in the year. And there's still so many games to play. We're not even through June yet. There's a whole three months almost to play until the season's over. I guess nine, nine-ish weeks, ten weeks. No, not even. No, more than that. What am I doing? There's the rest of June. There's July, August, and September. That's more than three months. I can count, but I, it, it fills me with anxiety that they're this far ahead and Fangraphs has them at 79% to win the division because there's, I mean, it could only really go wrong from here. And I, I, you'd think saying that out loud would be a, a jinx of some kind, but I truly don't think there's any cosmic energy that I could give off to affect the Seattle Mariners baseball team. I think they're a complete enigma. And I think there's just a chaotic team. And I just, I can't believe they're this far ahead this late in the year, but I digress. What are the couple things I want to talk about? A little bit of a prospect update from a trade perspective. There's a couple guys who are just like peaking right now in the minor leagues. Like it seems like, a couple key Mariners prospects are, are just peaking at the right time, specifically to Michaels, Michael Morales, and Michael Arroyo in particular are peaking right now. Uh, that Michael Morales is a pitcher for the Everett Aqua Sox, and he's just having a tremendous year, and he's been on a tear the last couple of weeks. Uh, on the year, though, he has a 2.22 ERA and 73 innings pitched, uh, 72 strikeouts, and it seems like... He's trending by the end of this month or next month a call up to potentially Arkansas, which is pitching lab territory. Um, and then Michael Arroyo, I've mentioned on the pod before as well. He is on the Modesto Nuts. 
He was a uh, international signing a few years ago, and he is also just he's been on a home run tear. I think he had four straight games with a home run last week or something crazy. Uh, but his season numbers looked phenomenal. Now he's up to two seventy five, four hundred one OBP. Where is his slugging? Why is it not listed here? Two seventy five, four hundred one, four ninety six slug for that's an eight ninety seven OPS. Uh, Eleven home runs, forty seven RBIs, eight stolen bases. Playing uh, shortstop second base, I think. Let's look at his fielding logs just to see where he's playing. I know he kind of came up as a shortstop middle infielder. Uh, yeah, mostly second base this year for the Nuts, some shortstop. I think now with uh, Colt Emerson out, I think Ty Pete's been playing more short, and Michael Arroyo's been second base. Uh, but he he reminds me of not Jonathan Class A, like bar for bar. Um, he's not like switch hitter. He's not an outfielder. But the height and weight to power ratio is what I'm what I'm feeling here, because uh, he's five eight one sixty, and he appears to have a good amount of power on his in his belt. So good for Michael Arroyo, good for Michael Morales. I mentioned this because they've caught my eye recently, and in terms of guys who are not in a top one hundred list. But likely in, like, the next 100, like if they did a 101 to 200 list, I think those guys are likely on that list. Having those guys in particular, and a couple other guys in the system that I didn't mention, um, having them just kind of kind of peaking right now is huge. It's a very valuable thing for the team with trade season approaching. Because uh, not only do the Mariners have a decent crop of top 100 guys to kind of dangle out there on the trade block, they also have proven talent in the minors beyond those top 100 guys who've been performing well this season. Uh, those two guys in particular, Michael Morales and Michael Arroyo. Not a whole lot has changed, I don't think, for this team in terms of like on the trade front. I still think the main need is corner outfields and another relief arm. With how Wu has looked, and he came out of the game a little early the other day, Maybe a fifth starter is on the table because um, Hancock just got hurt for the Rainiers last night. Uh, no word on what it is yet. A fifth starter feels like more of a throw-in trade. to a throw A guy to throw into a trade at this point, it feels like... I don't know if they'd make a blockbuster trade for a fifth starter. I think it'd be a... They trade for a big outfielder, and they get a innings eater fifth starter thrown in there just because they need it. Uh, I think even yeah, even just getting an innings eater, I think would suffice given the amount of talent they have one through four on that rotation. I don't know if they'd give Logan Evans a chance to start in Major League Baseball already, but maybe they would. I mean, they've been aggressive going from Double A to the bigs in the past. We've seen it, Bryce Miller, Brian Wu. Uh, they've been priming Logan Evans to be a bullpen guy recently, but with Hancock hurt now, and it was not a contact injury. I hope it's nothing bad. And with Wu just not looking like he can throw more than 70 pitches in a start, which is not what you want. I don't know. Maybe they now are, are reworking things with Logan Evans behind the scenes. And they're like, okay, we might actually want you to start. And we'll, we'll look at getting one to two relief arms at the deadline instead of just promoting you to be a reliever. I don't know. I don't know. I don't think much has changed on the trade front besides a potential fist starter, but that still doesn't feel, even if Wu and Hancock knock on wood or out for the year or whatever, I still don't think it should be a top priority to get a fist starter over a corner outfielder right now, uh, a guy who can actually hit baseball as well. But it's good. Michael Morales, Michael Rolio, these type of guys, I think would be ideal to attach to a top 100 guy to get a decent haul for a proven major league talent. And that is huge that this team has that right now. Uh, I would genuinely be surprised if Michael Arroyo is a Mariner after the trade deadline. It seems like it's primed for him to go to another org in a trade attached to Lazaro Montez, Cole Young, Harry Ford, something like that. Feels... Not inevitable, but feels likely. Um, But I will be doing a trade episode um, next month, probably, at the start of next month. 
given that, I'm sure Jerry will make a blockbuster before I release that episode. But we'll see. We'll see. Maybe he wants to wait for to hear my, my take on who's available. Uh, no, I'll, I'll be looking at trades more when the calendar turns to July, because I don't know. I still don't know if there's going to be a trade before July for the Mariners. That's super significant. So, All right, now to the Big League Club. The Big League Club. My first question to pose, what was Brent Brown, the former offensive coordinator, what was he telling these guys before the game? They fired the guy, and it's not like they've been the greatest offense in baseball, but they've been significantly better at the plate than they were uh, post Brant Brown firing. And there was murmurs after the firing that he was obviously something wasn't working. It takes a lot to be just kind of canned in the middle of a season as a coach in baseball. It seems there were reports that was like, he may have been overcomplicating things with the hitters. He just might not have been the best guy for that crop of hitters might not have gotten along with, a lot of guys in the locker room. It still is so funny to me. They hired the guy who basically fixed Jorge Soler's swing and then didn't sign Jorge Soler. I, I genuinely think that is just a hilarious thing to do. What was he doing in these pregame meetings with these hitters? Because it just kind of looks like, like was it just classic overthinking it? Was he just tweaking too much with guys? Was he making guys think too much about pitcher strategy and and what they should be looking for. Uh, Maybe it was literally as simple as that, because since he's been fired, the numbers are one thing and other people have talked about the numbers. I don't need to get into the number specifics. You can just kind of tell it's been better at the plate just based on vibes. It just seems like they're going up there and they're swinging the bat. Now, you know, good old fashioned, boomer take ass baseball no thoughts no little hitting cards just going up there and hitting the baseball baby uh it just kind of seems like that's what they've been doing it's been ridiculous i i don't know what he was telling them but clearly it was probably a good move to fire him because i think baseball is baseball is such a mental game and it's such a long season that if the hitters a weren't getting along with him and B, he was just kind of doing too much. It was probably best to let him go. I just, (laughs) it's just crazy. I can't believe I like, I've never seen an offensive bump like that in baseball after they fire, like the chief offensive guy. Uh, It's just been, it's just been very funny to see. Um, now the the offense, you know, guys have had a pretty good month of June. Um, it's has still been a little tough on Dylan Moore this month, but he had a great series against the Guardians. Uh, they you know they lost two or three, but he specifically had a couple a couple dingers that was really nice. Um, Luke Rayleigh has continued to have a really solid month of June. He's been striking out a, a decent amount, but providing enough power to justify at least in the small sample of June. Julio's numbers have ticked up, still probably not quite where we want him to be, but still a little bit better in the month of June than prior. Um, Ty France is back from his injury, and uh, J.P. Crawford, since he's been back from his injury, has been good. He hasn't been amazing, but he's been good and much, much better than he was prior uh, he actually he's, his hard hit rate has jumped significantly since coming back from injury, and his BABIP hasn't really jumped up too much either. So I'm expecting his numbers to tick up because he's in the month of June he's hitting 182, but he's slugging 409, and his WRC plus in the month of June is 104. Uh, his BABIP is 174 in the month of June, and what is his hard hit rate in the month of June? I've got it right here in front of me it's 44 percent, which is good it's not league leading but that is good that is actually second best on the team in june to dominic canzone among almost qualified hitters so i don't think his i don't think his uh 170 what is it 174 bab up i don't think that's gonna continue uh, especially because the strikeouts are 21 percent the walks are 13 percent and that is um is like right on of what he was last year just about 
So I expect his his average and his numbers to tick up a little bit more. Uh, but he's looked a lot better at the play since coming back. Mitch Hanniger continues to, to just be mid, especially fielding. Uh, Cal has not quite got back on track. And uh, Ryan Bliss hasn't looked great at the plate. And then um, Subby Savala just caught the DFA. Ty France came back, and since Tyler Locklear has been hitting pretty well at the major league level, uh, they kept Tyler Locklear on the squad, and they DFA'd Sebi Savala, which leads to some interesting lineup decisions. I want to talk about that, too. So, let's see. The past couple games, so Ty came back, and Tyler Locklear for two straight games has now rode the bench after starting uh, at first base almost every game when Ty was out. Leads to some questions here because I think we're at the point with Tyler Locklear where if you're not going to send him down, I think he needs to play every day just to get reps at the major league level. Uh, just kind of to both get his feet under him. And also it seems like he can kind of handle himself out there right now. But it's been a fairly normal lineup with Ty back at first the past couple days. I just They have so many interesting avenues they could go down. My initial thoughts here before Dylan Moore had a great series and even after it it's I is Dylan Moore might just need to play less because I think Rojas has proven enough to you that he's a good enough major league hitter after his insanely good start he's cooled off but I think he's still a good enough major league hitter and he's proven to be one of the best defenders at third base this season uh he is like second in outs above average at third base this year which is ridiculous that's another Perry Hill master class at work. Um, but so now with, with Ty France on the squad and Tyler Locklear on the squad, that is two guys who are very positionally limited. Garver has now slotted in as the backup catcher and DH, which is fine. He's going to catch a lot more than I expected him to this year, but um, for better or for worse, he has been great. He's been the Baron Mariners best hitter in June. So maybe putting him at catcher is genuinely getting him back on track like they said it would. And baseball is such a silly game that, yeah, maybe just catching and not being a full-time DH genuinely put him in a different mindset, and he's hitting better because of it. So I'm okay with Mitch Garver at backup catching and DHing. That's what he's done in his career, and he's had success doing it. And then, again, it leaves you with Mitch Hanniger, who is kind of being forced to play right field because Mitch Garver's DHing. And when he's not DHing, you can DH Hanniger if you want. But again, that's like, what, twice a week, maybe once a week. You get Dom Canzone, who has been a pretty good fielder out there, but maybe could also DH, but I'm fine with them in the field. Luke Rayley is not an amazing defender, but he's better than Mitch Hanniger. That's kind of the outfield look with Victor Robles also has been filling in in the corners and can play center if need be. And then you have Ryan Bliss, Dylan Moore, Ty France, and Tyler Locklear all on the right side of the infield with JP being your everyday shortstop and Rojas at this point being your everyday third baseman. Where does Tyler Locklear get playing time? Because I didn't think he should get playing time over Ty because Ty had looked great uh, the past few weeks of play, and I think he has kind of earned his first base spot back right now. And Tyler Locklear is pretty positionally limited himself. The only other position he's played in the minors uh, significantly has been third base. And again, I don't think you're starting him over Rojas at this point. So it sounds like they're going to try to play Tyler Locklear more against left-handed pitching. So do they sit Ty France against lefties and play Tyler Locklear first base? Ty France is not a good defender, and he's so slow but is it almost worth just trying to put him at second base in the meantime? Because Dylan Moore, I, I feel like Dylan Moore is still just his best role as utility guy. But then you have a further complication with Jorge Polanco coming back. And ideally, when Jorge Polanco comes back, he is your full-time second baseman. For better or for worse, I think you still have to try to stick with him while you can and hope he just gets back on track. And presumably then Ryan Bliss gets sent down. That's probably the move. And then Tyler Lockley's just here. Vibing. So maybe... Maybe you catch Garver intentionally against lefties. And you DH Locklear. 
against lefties, and then Locklear sits the rest of the time against right-handed pitching. I just, I just don't really know if this is the best for Locklear's development. But then I also don't think it's worth benching Ty France for Tyler Locklear. I just, because uh, he played today. Forgive me. Tyler Locklear was benched the first two games of Cleveland, but he played today. And he played first base. Ty France DH'd. And Garver uh, was the catcher. And that's against the lefty. So maybe that's what we see going forward. And Robles was in left field. Like they just do hyper platoon. with And Bliss was at second base today. I just, I... And Dylan Moore played third base also today. It was kind of a wacky, wacky, wacky lineup. Uh, I just, I don't know. It's, it's... It's not like they have a glut of really good players to figure out with, especially in the field and at the plate. They have a glut of, like, how do we get the most juice out of these these lemons that might not be great in the field or at the plate but can give us something? I just don't know. It's kind of a headache. And it's, when Polanco comes back, it's going to be even more of a headache. I, I feel like we're heading down the road to trading Tyler Locklear or Ty France. Either one. I don't know if they can coexist on the same team. Because ideally at this point, if Tyler Locklear looks convincing enough to the front office, they'd probably want him to be the full-time first baseman. I just don't know if he's going to be able to do that in such a small sample. And the small sample he's provided so far is nine games. It's 29 plate appearances. He's had two home runs, three RBIs, a stolen base, Slashing 222, 276, 481. His WOBA is 328. He has a 117 WRC plus, and all those numbers sound great. That's a good first nine games for a rookie. And then you look over at the walk strikeout numbers, and he's striking out 41% of the time and walking only 3% of the time. And that's not good at all. That's really bad. Alarm bells go off in my head when I see a guy striking out 40% of the time. So maybe they finish out the next few weeks with Tyler Locklear playing mostly first base against against a left-handed pitching. And if he keeps striking out 40% of the time, you might just have to send him back down to AAA. I just don't know. I don't know. It's a headache. Running a baseball team sounds so stressful. Um, but, yeah, I want to talk about that positional nightmare because Ty France came back. He got hit by a pitch today. Um, and I, th- I think Ty France at this point is the full-time first baseman unless he completely falls off a cliff again and looks more like he did last year. But he's looked at least better than last year. It's still probably not where you'd want your first base production to be, especially with poor defense. But it's better than being a below-average player out and out. So we'll take that. Um, and before I get out of here today, I do want to talk about Brian Wu. Brian Wu pitched uh, Wednesday's game after uh, skipping his start last week. Uh, talked about, I don't know if I even talked about that, but no, no I did. Skipped his start um, and then got back on track this week with, with the rotation. Uh, and he pitched on Wednesday against the Cleveland Guardians. And I think going into it, since they're still really trying to manage his health um, responsibly, I guess they were probably going to limit him to the 70, maybe 80 pitch count again. But he only ended up going four innings total and throwing 64 pitches before they pulled him and put in Mike Bauman for the fifth inning. And he wasn't in the dugout. After they pulled him, which is hopefully just like a normal post start, like arm, like getting his arm tended to because he's still recovering from injury. But even if that's the case, and that's probably best case scenario at this point is they didn't want to push him and throw him out there in the fifth inning at 64 pitches that they're going to limit him to like 75. They probably just were like, yeah, hey, we're going to cut our losses. He hasn't looked great. Um, like his previous couple short starts. And we're just going to put in the bullpen to try to finish this game. And that didn't go great. Uh, or it's like worst case scenario. And his arm is feeling the same thing that it's felt the past couple months of 
not catastrophic pain, but not feeling great after throwing some pitches and he needs like surgery or something. There's so many outcomes in between those. I just don't, even if it's the best possible scenario and they're just really keeping it close and really trying not to aggravate his arm and they're trying to keep his pitch count down. Is it worth having him on the team if he can't throw more than 70 pitches or if they're not going to let him? Because at a certain point, you have to just let the guy throw a normal amount of pitches or have him on the extended IL, put him on the 15-day, have him go through another throwing program until he feels 100% like he can throw 90-plus pitches in a start and go six innings, six innings plus, or you have him have surgery because there's clearly a problem. Like, is it worth having him on the team right now? Uh, and, you know, maybe you can say 75 pitches of Brian Wu is better than the alternative. And maybe that's true, but you still want your fifth start. You still want, you don't want every fifth day having to be a de, de facto bullpen game with a bullpen you're not super confident in right now. So I just don't know where they're at with him. I'm sure we'll hear more. I hope it's not heading down the direction of surgery, but the fact that they activated him off the IL and have been limiting his pitch count so much is like, is it even worth doing? I feel like it's more worth keeping him out for longer, going through a longer extended throwing program. And when he's back, you rehab him in Tacoma. Maybe he throws 50 pitches his first start, then like 75. And then once he's back in Seattle, you throw him out there for 90 plus pitches. You throw him out there like a normal pitcher. I feel like that is what should be expected of him when he comes back and pitching in in the major league squad instead of a five innings, you know, 64 pitch start. I just don't know. I I don't I feel like they might have brought him back from the aisle too early. Like I know they need the pitching, but again, how worth it is is it when you have a guy who's not going to go more than 70 pitches. Like, is it, it's it really worth trying to get him ready by having him f- have three straight starts of 70 pitches. I just don't know. It's tough. I'm sure it's, I'm sure it's tough on literally everyone involved trying to get this right, but it's a little frustrating as, as a, as a watcher of the team to see him not, go deep into games with a big pitch count. I mean, he's been super effective in his short outings and short pitch counts, but again, if he is ready to pitch in the major leagues, I don't want to hear he's ready to throw 70 pitches again. I want to hear, like, no, there's no limit. He's ready to go. He's back. I just hope we're not heading down the the surgery route that I have a feeling we might be. So with that great uplifting note, I'm going to cut it here. Thank you all for listening. Once again, RIP to Willie Mays. If you're listening and you're not familiar with Willie Mays' game, go just take a gander at his baseball reference page, his his wiki, um, and while you're at it, just like read about the, the history of baseball in the 50s, 60s, 70s. It was... Truly the heyday of baseball, and uh, it would have been awesome to watch baseball back in, back then. But, again, RIP Willie Mays. The game at Rickwood Field they're doing is really cool. Love that they're doing that. Um, and then I will leave you with a hearty, of course. Go Mariners. Uh, they're taking care of some Florida teams this week. They've got the Marlins and then the Rays, and I will be back next Thursday to talk about what happened in both of their series. So I hope you have a good rest of the week. And, of course, as always, go Mariners.